So for the next 40 minutes, uh, we'll be talking about dynamic cut analysis. Yeah. I work for SEP Security. We create uh, in the internet's first bot wall, which aims to deflect scripted bot attacks to our customers' website. And at night, if you don't find me fighting crimes, then uh, you'll see me dealing with some open source projects such as uh, Phantom, Phantom Jazz and Esprima. Some of you might have used that or uh, tried it. The goal of these projects are to improve the state of front-end development. And uh, a story that I want to use to illustrate the problem with front-end development is this one. So just like this most famous pixelated bird in the world, um, doing web development is kind of hostile and the uh, punishment is severe and you can't really move forward without having the right skills. If you, don't, if you don't learn it the right way, then there will be obstacle all over the places. But the, the benefit is that once you get over it, it's pretty addictive. Once you know your way and you learn the possible mistakes and hidden traps waiting for you, the next step is how will I prevent such mistake uh, automatically? How will I stop shooting myself in the foot? And this is where the next stage of uh, web development is so that you can have your you know, Gandalf moment. Basically, you should be able to tell yourself or some other folks that, hey, you, know, you can't do that because they'll break our application. Can anyone tell me how many things are wrong with this poster? Bet you didn't see that. <laughs> So in order to implement that, in order to uh, have a tool that tells me you can't do that because that's wrong, because uh, I've done that mistake in the past and I want to not repeat it again in the futures, we try to find out what is in our utility belt that we can use to build uh, such uh, tools. So the first thing that we need if you want to deal with JavaScript is a parser. The parser consumes your JavaScript code and produces syntax tree, and once you have the syntax tree, you can give it to a code generator. This gives us a very powerful and deadly combination that allows us to build all kind of uh, magic tools. Two tools that I'm going to cover today is code coverage, the first one, and the second one is uh, function instrumentation. And this falls into the dynamic analysis part of JavaScript uh, analysis tool, because to do analysis on uh, using both code coverage and function instrumentation, you need to actually run the code, and that's, for, that's why it's called dynamic. If you already use JSLIN, JSIN, ESIN, that's all static analysis tools because it inspects your code and it doesn't need to run it. But function instrumentation and code coverage work differently. They need to run your code. So as I mentioned briefly, if I have this code for answers equals 42, then a parser will do two steps. First, it will tokenize your code this will just split your code into a series of tokens. In this case, var is the keyword, answer is an identifier, and there's an equal sign there, and so on and so on. Once it gets the list of tokens, then it produces the syntax tree. This syntax tree sort of uh, resembles the semantic meaning of your code, and in this case, if uh, manually you look at the var answer equals 42, you will expect that it declares a variable the variable is called answer, and you need to assign a constant to that variable. And that's exactly what this uh, tree represents. If you want to play with the uh, syntax tree, uh, you can use uh, SpiderMonkey parser API that given that code, it will produce a tree in form of JSON. This is just simple JavaScript object. If you want to see everything in uh, full visualization, full-blown tree, then you can use uh, Esprit parser demo. If you go to that uh, URL, then whatever you type in the input box, Esprit will create a syntax tree and display it in the form of a tree. That permits an analysis of what, the code, what your code is doing with respect to the uh, syntax. Now, having a syntax is nice, but what will we be more amazing if we can transform it? And this is the, the rest of this presentation is all about. Source transformation of uh, JavaScript falls into two categories. The first one is what I call as uh, non-destructive. That's the left side. When we already got the code from the parser in the form of syntax tree, 
we need to manipulate the code in such a way that it doesn't destroy anything. It will still keep all things that you have in your code, such as comments, indentation, coding style, etc. The other one is called regenerative. It means that the syntax is then processed by a code generator that doesn't care on how you write the code in the first place. It will only care about the syntax tree and recreate the code that functionality uh, that has similar functionality to your original code. We're going to see a, a deep example of both. So let's uh, go and talk about code coverage first. Code coverage is a very good example of regenerative transformation. It doesn't really care how you put your common or how you inline your code because it doesn't really want to uh, see that at all. What, what the code coverage does is run your code, possibly run your test that exercise your code, and figure out the coverage of your code. Uh, the most prominent code coverage tool these days is Istanbul. And the way Istanbul works is by having uh, extra code injected into your uh, original code. In these two line of examples, after it's being instrumented by Istanbul, it becomes a couple of lines. And the first line is just setting up the coverage. Um, and that long name, variable names, is intended so that there won't be any conflict. It basically says that prefer, pre prepare this object to contain the coverage for hello.js, because that two lines happens to uh, reside on a file called hello.js. And you can see for every statement, every line, there is always a line before that that tells uh, that increment a counter, and that counter contains the information about the line number. So when the browser or Node.js or any kind of JavaScript uh, environment execute your code, that extra action happens as well. And this is the way uh, Istanbul can tell if your code, uh, if your particular statement has been covered or not. As an example, uh, this is a simple implementation of uh, Fibonacci sequence. If you're into rabbits, you must understand Fibonacci. The goal of this function is that given n, it will uh, compute the nth number in the Fibonacci series, starting with uh, 0 and 1. So we're not talking about only uh, statement coverage here. We're talking also about expression, because there's a ternary operational, a ternary condition inside the, the function. If n less than 2, then just return n. If n less, uh, greater or equals than 2, then compute then, uh, the result uh, depending uh, based on what the Fibonacci invented many, many years ago. Now, if your uh, test is only that line, Fibo 1 must give 1. If that's the only test that you have, Istanbul will highlight the fact that the second condition, the second expression there, that will be executed if n uh, is not less than 2, is not covered, so it's highlighted in yellow. That indicates that you haven't write a test yet that exercised that part of the code. So this is called expression coverage. It doesn't only work line by line, because if you consider that line, that return, that line that contains written statement is already executed. But we need to dig deeper and see in that line, there are two parts, two expression. Apparently, one is not exercised by our very simple test. Also very important is something called branch coverage. If you have a branch, uh, and you must write branch all the time using if, while, or do while, and, and so on, or even the ternary can, uh, oper operator that I mentioned earlier, then there will be two branches, at least for if statement. The one that gets executed if the condition is true, and the one that gets executed if the condition is false. In this example, there's a bug there um, in the return statement. Um, I hope you'll be able to find out if you start this slide uh, long enough. But the test is very simple. The test is, if I pass 4 to this function, it needs to return 5. And the test passes with flying colors, no problem. However, if you run this through Istanbul, it complains there's a big E icon there, indicates that the else branch of my if statement is not covered at all. And that's why the bug in this uh, function is hidden. The bug is there waiting for ha waiting as an accident waiting to happen, but you will never see it until you write another test that exercises that uh, else path. So Istanbul used the E icon if the else ban branch is not uh, covered, and I icon if the if branch is not covered. That corresponds to whether the condition is false or true, respectively. Here's the uh, pictorial representation of the problem. So I have a condition 
And I, if the condition is fulfilled, I go to the right side, and then I'll execute another statement. The last one is the return statement. However, in this particular example, apparently Istanbul tells me that I never execute the code that uh, goes straight from the condition to the return statement. That's the else branch that has no statement at all. So in short, having only statement expressing coverage, it won't tell you the full story because it doesn't, it doesn't exercise all the possible branches and all possible code execution in your program. And speaking about branch, you could also exploit branch in a different way. Uh, Dave already mentioned this in his keynote. The best way to make things faster is by taking shortcut. Uh, so hence this very simple uh, flowchart. This is, I'm playing Captain Obvious because obviously this is common sense. One of the things that you can find out after you do a lot of branch coverage is how many times one branch is executed compared to the others. And this is very useful to, uh, to do an optimization that's called profile guided optimization. Here's the function, it's digit that accepts of an argument. The purpose of this function is that it has to return true if that argument is a digit, very obvious. There are many ways to implement this regular expression, if and so on and so on. I just use a simple index of function. But if we monitor what kind of data is being fed into this function, apparently in some hypothetical situation, most of the time we call this function with space. We, we hardly call this function with letters and digits. And therefore, space is the one that is being uh, tested all the time. And we can take shortcut in that case, because we can first check whether uh, the argument is space or not. In that case, we return false, or we make it uh, as conditional. So the expensive part, the computing of, or the execution of index of function will not be there unless the argument is not space. This is called taking shortcut. And this happens only if you manage to find out the right profile of the data that you give to your uh, program. A lot of you might have used or might use uh, QUnit. This is jQuery conference after all. Uh, there's a nice way to exercise code coverage of QUnit. Uh, you can use Karma, which is test runner. Karma supports many different test library, among others QUnit. Karma can also run your tests with different number of browsers uh, or headlessly via PhantomJS. Istanbul is the uh, coverage, lib coverage tool that uh, we're using. In that blog post link in that slide, uh, I created a simple GitHub repo that demonstrates the, uh, the use of Istanbul QUnit and Karma. In that example, I have uh, my own implementation of square root called my.squareRoot, and this is the test for that. I only test one condition, which is, is the square root of four equals two. However, if you look at the code, the code does some more magic. The code tests if x is negative, because in that case, I just throw an exception. Now, as you can see, I can run the code. I mean, in fact, let me try to do some demo here. So when I run NPM tests, it's also bound to a, a, as a grunt ta a task. It runs my test and says that the task passes. But if you see the coverage result, then you can see that, again, there's an icon there, I, which indicates that my test never exercised the if, part, if uh, branch, which is when the condition is true. That means that my single test here My single test there passes beautifully, but if you look at the code coverage, I actually have to write more tests if I want to cover all branches uh, in, that, in, in my square root uh, implementation. So if you already use QUnit for your tests and you want to ex exercise the code coverage, you can use the combination of Karma and Istanbul to do that. In fact, this very nice expression saying from Dave Glass from Yahoo is, uh, is probably the one that more or less resembles your feeling if you use Istanbul for the first time. How many of you here have done code coverage analysis on your tests? And with branch coverage? All right, I hope the number increases next year. So possibly you can also share the feeling that the first time you run Istanbul to check code coverage, 
you will be completely disappointed because you think that you have written all the good tests, but apparently it's not. And for those who do not live in California, you can also play this song um, as you uh, run your code coverage analysis for the first time because this also happened to me. Um, you run code coverage and you realize that uh, Istanbul breaks your heart. You think you're doing good, but apparently it tells you that your tests uh, still suck. Big time. So that's about code coverage. Code coverage allows us to tell us, uh, are, are the tests good? And later on, I'll show you how to uh, use the coverage threshold to prevent you from uh, regressing the code coverage. Function instrumentation deals with a different topic. Function instrumentation is a, a form of non-destructive transformation because basically what you want to do is you, you don't want to inject all kind of uh, instrumentation into your code. You just want to monitor certain functions. And therefore, you want to do in-place modification. A very good example of non-destructive transformation is when you change string literal uh, quotes. Because JavaScript is wonderful. You can write string, quote, uh, string literals with single quote or double quote. You'll see that if people come from C, C++ or Java, they'll write it with double quotes. But if the coding style of your project says it has to be single quote, then you need to do inline modification. You don't want to change everything. You just want to search for those quotes that represent string literal and change it with single quotes. That's a non-destructive modification. In the case of uh, function instrumentation, the reason we want to do uh, instrumentation on a certain function is so that we're able to do the, the last part, which Dave also showed in his keynote. When we talk about performance, there are many different ways to analyze performance, and these three are uh, the most important ones. What we normally do is the timing, uh, the stopwatch measure, like when you run in an athletic track. This is all those jazz perf, uh, an explosion of all jazz perf tests that checks the absolute time between uh, the beginning and the end of this certain operation. There's also sampling, which you can be using a lot of browser developer tools. Uh, Dave uh, demonstrated live, um, where you start the profilers and stop it after, after a while, and therefore you can see all these uh, uh, differences of where, where the, the JavaScript engine spend its time most. The last one is tracing, because you want to track how many times certain function is being executed for example, or just to track all calls and exits. An example of this is uh, when you design, for example, an address book. This is not a question of absolute time, whether the time to sort a uh, context in your address book is, is fast enough. Imagine you have an engineer assigned to implement that uh, sorting, and then you ask that person, how's the speed? And then the answer is, OK, 10 contacts, 2 milliseconds. It's nice, but it doesn't tell the whole picture. Because it only tells you that if you have 10 contacts, then in 2 milliseconds, what about 100? What about 1,000? What about a million? What about an infinite uh, scroll? You look at the code, and it looks like this. Right? This is your WTTF moment, because apparently the sorting algorithm is implemented using bubble sort. Now, in this example, it's very easy, because I neatly format the code. And you can see that there's an outer loop, inner loop. You probably can guess that this is bubble sort. But in reality, doing a formal analysis of any kind of big project is almost impossible or uh, cost prohibitive. What we can do instead of doing formal analysis is to do a runtime complexity profiling. In this case, for example, I know that RI prototype swap, the function that I invent, is extremely critical. It's pretty much like the slice example in, uh, in Dave's keynote. So I want to do instrumentation on that code. You can do this manually. You can also do this uh, automatically, because you already have the tools that parse the syntax tree and then inject that line of code. In that case, that function becomes a little bit longer, and the second version has extra log function that will be called every time this function is invoked. And this is your hook. This is where you can find out how many times a function is being called. Let me see if the demo works again. So here's that implementation of function, and that's bubble sort. So when I click one, behind the scenes, this demo instrument all function and then measure how many times the function is uh, being invoked. So you can see on the left side here, if I mouse hover there, 
then I can see that swap is being called almost 5,000 times. This one is being called one time, which we don't really care. You can change the list to 1,000, and you can see that it's going to take a while until it's being executed. But you're not interested in the absolute time, but you only care about this. This is now called almost uh, half a million times. So that's the runtime complexity profiling. Now, if you plot the chart, if you have different uh, set of data that you feed to this uh, sorting implementation, then you can find out the number of calls uh, with respect to the input size. Again, we don't really care how long does it take. All we care is uh, how, how many times the function is being invoked. This falls into the optimization theory from uh, this great book from Stephen Covey. How many, how many of you have read this book, first thing first? Uh, the idea is very simple. If you want to fill a jar with rocks and pebbles and sand, then you need to fill it with the big thing first. You need to aim for the biggest win first. Uh, that way, you can uh, totally utilize your time uh, really optimally and efficiently. Once you already start to monitor all function calls, then you can find out, hey, this function is being called a million times. Maybe we should try to optimize that first. Now, make no mistake, there's no bearings between how long does a function will run and how many times it's being executed. However, you can use that information for regression. If you write a simple jQuery mobile application, you can find out how many functions are being called as soon as the application starts up, and that number should be something that you monitor in your continu continuous integration system, meaning that we don't really care the, about the numbers itself, but if someone checks in the code that suddenly doubles or triple or quadruple the amount of function that is being called, then probably it's time to step back and uh, you know, take a look at and see what happens there. Is, it, is that a legit, legitimate chance? Is that something that you want to do? Or was that uh, an honest mistake? In other words, we want to be defensive. We want to place as many layers of defense as possible before someone can breach our headquarters. And in some cases, uh, putting this as part of your continuous integration helps people to, or contributors to your project to be more objective. In other words, if, if someone writes code and then you know, some guy in the, in the team says your code sucks, you might be slightly off offended. You might take it personally. Even worse, because if you grow fear, we all know that fear can lead to anger and anger is to hate and hate to suffering. We don't want you to fall to the uh, dark side, and therefore, if you implement certain measures in your system, integration system that allows you, allows a machine or a tool to tell us that your code sucks, you might take things differently. I mean, if my MacBook says my test sucks, what can I do? I can punch it, but it's my loss. Now, this uh, brings me into this test madness. We have TDD, we have BDD, and at this rate, I'm not surprised if PDD even plays some roles in our uh, test. <laughs> what we need to ask ourselves is that, do we need to level up in our test? Do we need to do more uh, than just the test passes or the coverage is fulfilled? So something that Istanbul can do is to check uh, certain coverage as a threshold. In this command line, Istanbul check dash coverage, dash, dash statement minus five, it means that at most only five statements are uncovered. If there's more, then it will complain. Same with branch uh, and same with functions. This places guards. This, this, this allows you to, to, to play this uh, Gandalf moment where someone write the function, forgot to write the test, then Istanbul will complain because suddenly the coverage uh, regresses. In other words, Tools is the one that separates us from this Neanderthal JavaScript programmer. If you don't believe me, look left and right. You don't see those Neanderthals anymore around us. And uh, they, they didn't manage to survive this apocalypse, mainly because they didn't use the right tools in our future development. In other words, you're probably already familiar with static uh, code analysis for JavaScript, but start to explore all kind of dynamic code analysis. And two things that I can recommend is uh, code coverage and uh, function instrumentation. Thank you very much.